Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 2024 PKD Summit. My name is Michelle Lynn Goodfellow, and I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager for the PKD Foundation of Canada, which is the only national organization solely dedicated to fighting PKD through research, education, advocacy, support, and awareness. This session on the topic of caregiver burnout and kidney disease is being presented by nephrology social workers, Barb Sexsmith and Tricia Hutton. We will have a live question and answer period after Barb and Tricia's presentation, but feel free to leave any questions in the chat or in the Q&A area throughout the session and we'll address them during the live Q&A. This session is being recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. I'll now introduce our presenters. Barb Sexsmith is a social worker with Halton Healthcare in Oakville, Ontario. Her background as a hospital social worker has included working with patients and families on a variety of inpatient units, such as medical surgical, complex care, and rehab. Barb joined the renal team and the Canadian Association of Nephrology Social Workers, CANSW, in January 2020, and currently works with outpatients on the in-center hemodialysis unit, as well as independent dialysis patients, both PD and HHD. Trisha Hutton is a social worker with the Saskatchewan Health Authority in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Trisha works with outpatient dialysis patients at St. Paul's Hospital in Saskatoon, as well as the satellite units throughout central and northern Saskatchewan. Trisha joined CANSW in 2012, and has served as Saskatchewan Manitoba Regional Representative, Vice President, and currently serves as President. Welcome, Barb and Tricia. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you're here to join us uh, with the PKD Foundation. So I am Trisha Hutton, and with me, I have Barb Sexsmith. Um, so we are here to talk to you today about caregiver burnout and how to avoid it. Um, so Barb and I both belong to the Canadian Association of Nephrology Social Workers. So that's composed um, of a group of nephrology social workers who work with patients with kidney health um, from pre-dialysis to dialysis, um, transplant, conservative care. We kind of encompass it all. And we work with patients and families to understand their situations um, in relation to their social, emotional and physical health. Uh, and then we also provide assessment and support for our nephrology patients and their families. I um, work in Saskatchewan and Barb is in Ontario. I'll pass it over to Barb here. I guess I should have uh, moved my slide. Maybe. Okay. So we just wanted to start with a little definition of who is the caregiver. Um, and I can read it. This is from the International Alliance of Carer Organizations, a caregiver carer or family caregiver, as they are referred to around the world, is an unpaid individual, such as a family member, neighbor, friend, or other significant individual who takes on a caring role to support someone with a diminishing physical ability, a debilitating cognitive condition, or a chronic life-limiting illness. The terms caregiver, family caregiver, and carer are used interchangeably by IACO members. Um, and this is just one of the definitions that we found. If you were to Google it, they're, they're all pretty similar in terms of basically it's somebody who provides unpaid care for somebody else. So for the Caregiver Bill of Rights, as a caregiver, I have the right to be respected for the work I choose to do, to take pride in my work and know that I'm making a difference to garner appreciation and validation for the care I give others, to discern my personal boundaries and have others respect my choices, to seek assistance from others if and when necessary, to take time off to re-energize myself, to socialize, maintain my interests and sustain a balanced lifestyle, to my own feelings, including negative emotions such as anger, sadness and frustration, to express my thoughts and feelings in an appropriate way <clears throat> to people at appropriate times, 
to convey hope to those in my care, to believe those in my care will prosper in mind, body, and spirit as a result of my caregiving. So we wanted to talk a little bit about caregiver stress. And uh, everybody has experienced stress on, on different levels, I'm sure, throughout their life. But chronic stress occurs when we have ongoing demands that seem to never end. And as an example, providing care to somebody with a chronic illness. Um, people become accustomed to this chronic level of stress, and then this constant baseline becomes their new normal. Sometimes people forget or don't even realize that they're experiencing stress. Therefore, caregivers are at risk for developing their own health issues due to the chronic uh, stress, and it's important to have some good self-care. We're going to talk a little bit about some of those things. But um, the other factor is that the long-term activation of the stress response system and too much exposure to cortisol and other stress hormones can disrupt almost all of the body's processes. And then that puts the caregiver at higher risk of many health problems. We just have like a little picture of somebody who's trying to juggle work, caregiving, household responsibilities, et cetera. Um, I'm sure everybody's had some level of experience with this. So the stresses of caregiving can often be insidious and often trace back to the caregiver neglecting their own mental health and physical health. These triggers may happen slowly and burnout may be hard to identify. Some warning signs include that you're not enjoying the social activities and friends or losing interest in activities that you used to enjoy. You find it a chore to leave the house. You are more irritable and have mood changes, becoming easily irked or angry. It's difficult to concentrate and get things done. You are sleeping too much or not enough, often feeling tired. Your weight may be affected, going up or down. You might feel anxious or depressed, feeling burdened, worrying all the time. You might have physical complaints such as headaches or pains, and you get sick more often with both minor and major ailments. Those warning signs continue and you might be feeling sad. You might be misusing alcohol or drugs, including prescription medications, or missing your own medical appointments. So all of these factors take a toll on the caregiver. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the different aspects. Emotionally, uh, many times while caring for someone, it can be rewarding, but it can also create um, an emotional toll. And oftentimes, caregivers struggle with a roller coaster of various emotions, depression, anxiety, sadness, guilt, anger. Uh, frustration, etc. And this next quote, um, I'll, I'll go over that a little bit. Caregivers are investing 10 plus hours a week providing care to a family member, friend, or neighbor. Caregivers say they feel exhausted, overwhelmed, trapped, worried. Half say their mental health has declined since last year. So I just want to clarify that this um, quote we found a couple of years ago my colleague. So I was trying to do some additional research about how much time do people spend. It's actually kind of difficult to find a, an exact number of how much time people spend. I think it's significantly more than 10 hours a week. And there's the, the time and then the financial cost of that. Um, there is information, there's actually if you were to go online, quite a lot of information about how much time and unpaid uh, money is going towards people who are providing care. So the Canadian Institute for Health Information has a lot of statistics on, on different topics. And one of them is how much um, hours are being spent looking after somebody else. So we just wanted to highlight that, that we wanted to recognize that providing that uh, unpaid care is significant. 
Uh, there's also physical aspects, a physical and emotional strain from caregiving can take its toll on the health of the caregiver. Again, chronic stress leads to poor sleep, bad eating habits, lack of exercise. Uh, many caregivers also start to have their own health issues if they continue to follow this pattern. And from a practical uh, point of view, the added time spent caregiving sometimes means caregivers wrap things in their own lives that they would have previously done, such as uh, hobbies or working, and they reduce their social and recreational outings, and that often leads to more isolation. So the next um, slide is we just have a picture here of Maslow's hierarchy. Most people know something about this or they've heard about it. At the very bottom, uh, we talk about physiological needs, just the very basic things that everybody needs, breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. And we've already talked a little bit about some of the things that people give up um, as a result of caregiver stress, sleeping, Eating well is often one of the things that I, when I talk to people that they, that they struggle with. And you can see the uh, diagram, things kind of go up from there. In order to look after safety and security, you have to have the physiological needs be met. Um, and then the next level is just love and belonging. In order to have that, you have to have the first two, the physiological and the safety and security met. Then the love and belonging, self-esteem, et cetera, and then the self-actualization. So we just wanted to highlight this, that it's there's some really basic needs that as a caregiver, um, everybody needs to be cognizant of. And oftentimes the caregiver is so busy meeting the needs of others and they, they just neglect uh, their own needs. And sometimes you have to ask yourself what are the things that have to happen in order for the family to function and what things could wait so i have an example a friend of mine uh, years ago had to make a decision about what could wait in her life and it was a time in her life where she had two young kids uh, preschool uh, her spouse who traveled a lot for work and was away from home she was working on her PhD and also had the role of caregiver for her grandmother. So she had to make some decisions about what was going to wait. So she realized at that time that the only thing she could really put on hold was working on her PhD. She really wanted to look after her grandmother because her grandmother had looked after her when she was younger and, and uh, she was a big part of her life. So this was something that she wanted to do and she found it quite rewarding. But as a result, she had to put her PhD on hold and eventually she did go on and, and finish it. But it was a difficult, uh, very challenging decision to make. And um, that's just an example sometimes of, of the things that people have to decide what's absolutely necessary right now. and and what can I put off to another time? <clears throat> and we've talked a little bit about the main causes of caregiver burnout. Um, so the main causes are prioritizing the needs and interests of your loved one over yourself, having unrealistic expectations, lack of support from family or friends, and then juggling multiple commitments all at the same time. And so when that takes place, you've got the signs to kind of be looking for, so anxiety, depression, consistently feeling exhausted, neglecting your own well-being, falling sick more often, changes in sleeping patterns and changes in appetite or weight gain. And then what can we do to prevent that? So that's what we're going to kind of focus on now. So setting realistic expectations. I think that's one of the biggest things um, sometimes as a caregiver that we forget to stop and do and that we don't have to do it all. What is absolutely necessary? Um, so as Barb kind of talked about looking at that hierarchy of needs and what is absolutely mandatory, what would be nice to get done, but isn't going to disrupt things if we don't get to it um, and figuring out what you need to do and maybe what someone else can help with. So embracing your role as a caregiver, practicing self-care, 
joining a caregiver support group. And we're going to talk a little bit more about where you might be able to find some supports like that. Taking regular breaks and then relaxing and meditating. So one of the ways that um, we wanted to just kind of introduce this idea about setting boundaries and it's hard to set a boundary until you know exactly what things you're taking on. So this is just a list of some ideas of creating, sit down with a pen and paper and create a list of every role and responsibility, even if it seems simple and mundane, but make sure you include everything, cooking meals for your family, doing the grocery shopping, cleaning your home, cleaning somebody else's home, um, taxi driver for friends, appointments, et cetera. Even making appointments on behalf of somebody else, it's a task as a caregiver that you're doing um, that needs to be included in that list. So just try and think of everything that, that you do um, and then sit down and say, okay, are these things manageable? You might look at it and think, wow, there's 25 extra things that I'm doing today or tomorrow or this week that I wouldn't be doing if I wasn't, um, you know, providing extra care. So you have to really think, are these things manageable? Yes or no? Who can help? Is anything, can anything be delegated? Even if it means somebody taking uh, an appointment or booking an appointment or picking something up at the store, any little thing can, can be helpful. Um, assess and become aware of how you spend your time and where you can possibly gain time. For example, one hot topic is always how much time we spend scrolling the media. Now that might be something that's really relaxing or it could be something that somebody goes down the rabbit hole and thinks, oh, I'm going to spend 10 minutes and two hours later they've watched, you know, umpteen reels on Facebook or <laughs> something. But sometimes there's ways to find a little bit of extra time. Um, is it possible to say no to what is absolutely not necessary? So sit back and think, okay, are, are there things, does it mean I, I, I'm gonna vacuum my house, but not dust today, or whatever the case might be, whatever things you have to decide are really, really important and what things might be able to be uh, put on hold. Um, and make some boundaries about how that's going to happen. And sometimes one, one of the things that I find a lot of people ask me is that they, they manage some of the day-to-day -day stuff, but they just can't get around to, to cleaning their house, for example. And that's something that's really important. I mean, here in Ontario, there's no free services for people to help with that. So sometimes it's a paid a service that people have to look at. But I also talk about, well, is that the absolute most important thing that has to get done right now? Or could it be put off for a day or two? Or could that be delegated to somebody? So just really stop and think about all the different, different um, responsibilities that you have. And then looking at steps to self-care, so if it feels wrong, don't do it. Do say exactly what you mean. Don't be a people pleaser. Trust your instincts. Never speak bad about yourself. Never give up on your dreams. Don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say yes. Those are both kind of the things that Barb was just talking about there. Be kind to yourself. Let go of what you can't control. Stay away from drama and negativity. And then that self-love component. So taking care of the caregiver, um, I mean, perhaps it's, we're, I feel in some ways that we're kind of repeating things, but the one thing that we're, the topic is caregiver um, burnout and how to avoid it. I don't know that there's a magic fix to avoid it. But one of the most common themes is that people have to look after themselves. You can't look after somebody else if you're not able to look after yourself in this process. So one of the things 
is just, uh, it's helpful to know that you're not alone, that you can reach out and connect with others. So there's the peer support groups um, through Kidney Foundation and PKD Foundation. Really endeavor to not neglect your own health needs. Aim to maintain a healthy balance uh, in life wherever you can. And whatever that means for you, consider time in nature, exercise, even if it means getting outside and doing a, a 10 minute walk, um, getting a good sleep if you can, uh, or at least try to develop some good sleep habits, having good nutrition. I know it's uh, very tempting to go for the comfort food. I'm sure I'm not the only one that had poutine for dinner last night, but uh, it was needed. But those things are fine in moderation. Uh, it, can leave you kind of sluggish and not feeling great. So again, just be cognizant of trying to work in the, the good and healthy stuff that's nutritionally gonna help bolster you uh, whenever you can. And then of course, spending time with family, friends, um, in person or you know on screen, whatever works for you. The other thing, again, is just recognizing and accepting when something is beyond your control. There might just be things that are not possible to do. Nobody is superhuman. And again, it's, it's coming back to prioritizing what's absolutely necessary and, and what things can wait. Um, look for ways, again, to offload tasks. Who can share the load? Who can help? And um, don't be afraid to lean on family, friends, neighbors, church groups, community supports where you can. Um, one of the things that um, I know I, uh, some people have done is like a meal train. So whether it's somebody who's going through an acute illness or just something that's needed on an ongoing basis to you know, delegate somebody to create some kind of a meal train or a meal program where there's a food ready-made meal uh, either for the freezer or that can be brought over again just one less thing that you might have to worry about and um, another thought some people have done is create if there's if you're concerned about trying to keep other friends or family up to date with what with what's going on with uh, your health situation is to create a group email or a text group where family members and friends can be kept up to date with what's happening because I know some people have also said it's exhausting telling the same story over and over and over to different people but you want to keep people informed so that can be a really useful tool people have said that that's been really helpful and I think the other thing too that's really important here is when you look at the tasks that you have to get done sometimes you can become overwhelmed with just that. Um, and so breaking down those tasks into small doable pieces, like if I'm filing taxes, that can really be something that be, seems like it's just too much. You just can't get it done. But maybe today you can gather the documents that you need for tomorrow, right? And so then tomorrow, when you go to do the filing of the taxes, you at least have it all together. Um, so breaking down big tasks into small ones. Mm -hmm. And these are just some other other um, ideas to accept help when offered. So if somebody does offer to get you your groceries or provide a meal to pick up the meds, clean your house, just say yes. Uh, they're doing it because it's a practical and tangible way that they can support and help you. And there might not be anything else that they can do. And I always think that you'll always have a way to pay it forward at some point in the future. And so if someone says, hey, I want to do something for you, let them do it. And also don't be afraid to ask for help and be specific. So just going back to the meal train idea, some people have special dietary needs, um, you know, or, or gluten free or, uh, you know, renal friendly diet, etc. If you know of allergies, or specific recipes that you would like people to make, then let them know. And they, I find that people really appreciate that and they feel like what they're doing and that contribution is actually more meaningful because they know the person's going to enjoy whatever it is that you know they're making for them. 
Um, again, going back to just setting the realistic goals, rather than trying to accomplish four or five tasks in a day, break it down. Like Trish said, you can't, you know, if it, all you can do one day is just gather all the documents and put them in a special spot, then the next day you can move on to the next task. And it's okay to, again, not be superhuman. Um, do one or two tasks, not, not four or five. You have permission to say no, even if it means to the person that you're providing care to on occasion. Again, it all comes down to what is absolutely necessary, what can make, what can wait, and prioritizing. Um, being flexible, adjusting plans and goals as needed. I mean, lots of times you wake up in the morning, think I'm going to get these, you know, things done today, but for whatever reason, something happens and comes up and you have to readjust. And again, that's okay. Uh, just be kind to yourself. If you feel exhausted mentally, physically, that's okay. That's a time for you to reset and think, okay, I need to take some things off my plate. I'm gonna leave things as they are and I'm gonna try and rest up. Um, now I indicated on here, respite, this is, um, you know, there are respite care options sometimes depending on the situation. So that could be an option depending on, on where you live and what services are available for you. And then I think it's really important to kind of take that time, I would say maybe even twice a month to just do a little bit of a self-assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so looking down and say, you know, do I feel that I don't have enough time for myself? Am I feeling stressed between caring for my loved one and trying to meet my other responsibilities? Am I angry when you're around my loved one? That your professor, or sorry, personal health has suffered as a result of caring for your loved one. That you don't have as much privacy as you'd like to have. That your social life is suffering and that you've lost control. And I think when you do this kind of consistently, you get to get an idea of where you're at. Um, and maybe some of those things that you could be doing to bring yourself back to a better place. Sometimes we don't have control over all of that. Um, and sometimes it's just making a small adjustment. So if my social life is suffering and I'm, you know, really um, get hit always on that, maybe there's somebody that can come and visit me instead of me feeling that I have to go out and visit them all the time. Um, maybe it won't look exactly the same as what it used to before, but maybe there's something I can do in here with a small adjustment to help myself be in a better place. <clears throat> the other thing we wanted to bring attention to was just um, the idea of celebrating caregivers and recognizing the, the time and the effort that uh, caregivers bring on a daily basis. And to be honest, until I started diving into this a little bit more, I didn't even realize that um, we actually have a national caregiver day, the second Tuesday of April. So next April, I'm definitely going to be a little bit more attuned to hear what's going on, if there is anything out there <laughs> in the media. But um, again, like a central part of Carers Canada's work is leading the National Caregiver Day campaign. So the first Tuesday of April, it's been unanim unanimously adopted by the members of Parliament of Canada to recognize the importance of the invisible unpaid worker. And I think that that's um, really kind of key is that we don't want to be invisible. We want people to know that there is a great deal of time and effort and um, unpaid care towards so many people. Um, so it's also known as Nas National Caregiver Day. It marks the formal recognition of caregivers and the valuable contribution they make to care recipients, communities, and economy. So I would just encourage everybody to, you know, kind of be aware of the second Tuesday of April. They, uh, their campaigns have included educational sessions, webinars, um, caregivers' experiences about local supports and programming, federal government engagement, 
with lunches and breakfasts on Parliament Hill, endorsements from the Prime Minister, Health Minister, and other senior officials, and uh, engaging grassroots organizations in joint communications and information sessions, and um, again, profiling caregiver voices through the online pledge wall through the Canadian Home Care Association. And then I think for resources, your local and community home care, they can provide support such as like personal support workers, caregiver relief, occupational therapy assessments to determine needs and equipment. This is of course gonna be different all across Canada. So what I can access in Saskatchewan versus what Barb can access in Ontario will be different, but it's worth reaching out to see what is available in your area. I know here for us as well, what's available rurally versus urban is also quite different. So consider paying for some private support if that's financially feasible. Um, so Barb talked a little bit on that. So maybe it's a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, maybe it's having somebody to come in to sit with your loved one for a little bit of time so that you can go and do some grocery shopping. Some mental health support. So talking to your family doctor for a referral to counseling or look for some fee for service mental health agencies. And in just a minute here, we're also going to show you some op uh, opportunities of no fee. The Kidney Foundation of Canada definitely has support and education as well as support groups that they run online. Um, so that's a really good avenue to go to. And then ensuring that your power of attorney for personal care and property are complete and up to date because that's an important part of your own care as well. And then, like I said, the Kidney Foundation of Canada. Um, so they have got a caregiver support group. Again, that's online, um, so available to anyone across Canada. And your Kidney Foundation will have an office local as well. Um, they're a great resource to reach out to. The Canadian Mental Health Association has a care for the caregiver, which is also a free group. And you can see uh, the little brochure just to the side there. And then the Canadian Centre for uh, Caregiving Excellence. So Barb's touched on that a few times throughout um, the presentation today, but there are some fantastic videos. Um, so Barb, I know I'm going to miss some of these, but there's videos in there such as um, how to cut somebody's hair or how to bath them. Um, just some really excellent supports. Um, and then the PKD Foundation has got some education and resources. And then there's also the Canadian uh, Home Care Association. And the other thing just to um, keep in mind is that there are some financial resources and these are Canadian financial resources. So again, provinces might have something a little bit different, but there is an uh, employment insurance caregiving benefit. So if somebody has to take time off work to help provide care to somebody else. There's different categories. So if you're providing care for a child who's been critically ill or injured under the age of 18, you could be eligible for some payments up to 35 weeks, so take 35 weeks off work if necessary. And then there's also the family caregiver benefit for adults, again, up to 15 weeks if you are providing um, support or care to a critically ill or injured person. And um, just to clarify, I helped fill out a couple of those ones recently, the family caregiver benefit. So it could be somebody who has an ongoing chronic illness and then they become acutely ill and maybe are hospitalized or just need more care. So somebody, uh, a family member or somebody who they treat as a family member would be able to apply for that benefit. And the period of critical illness doesn't have to be for 15 weeks. So they might be really sick or in the hospital for a couple of weeks, but they continue to need care and support. So that is um, possibly available for up to 15 weeks. And then there's the compassionate care benefits, which um, can allow up to 26 weeks for anybody of any age who might require end of life care. And again, these are dependent on somebody who's been working and is paying into employment insurance. So they have to qualify and, um, but the physician or 
the social worker can help facilitate getting some of those forms completed. It has to be signed by the physician, of course. Yeah. And then there's some additional resources, um, disability tax credit and the caregiver tax credit. So there's a number of conditions that somebody might be eligible for the disability tax credit. And um, it, it, so if, if the individual person is eligible for the tax credit, but they're being cared for by somebody else, then the caregiver might be able to claim that amount when they're doing their taxes. And then the Kidney Foundation has a great section about tax tips and they talk about the, um, the tax credits. And then I also always encourage people just look at employer benefits, sick days, personal days, um, any other kind of benefits that you might have in order to take some time off work if you had to care for somebody for a period of time. I feel like we've only really touched on some of the resources and information that's out there. <laughs> So then I think we'd like to open it up for some questions as well. Um, mm -hmm. I did send off this morning a list of resources that will go over the majority of the information shared as well as um, those websites that you can go to to look at um, some of those caregiving videos, um, how to care for someone. Uh, it'll also go over some of the financial pieces like the disability tax credit and the um, employment insurance. I'm just having a quick peek here to see. Oh, I see Kathleen has got the resources there uploaded into the chat. And so maybe if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask any questions you may have, or if you want to type something into the chat. Thanks so much, Barb and Tricia. <clears throat> I can help. Uh, facilitate the question and answer period. So, um, of course, if anyone who is attending has any questions they would like to ask Patricia uh, and Barb while you've got them available here, please feel free to put questions in the chat or in the Q and A in the Q and A box. I do have some um, uh, questions prepared ahead of time. Oh, we've got one there already. Uh, someone's asking, does your unit or units do anything for National Caregiver Day? Well, so our unit in Saskatoon does not. Um, that's something that we, both Barb and I, I don't think knew much about the specific Caregiver Day until Barb did some digging on that. So mm -hmm. I think it's something for us to aspire to do in years coming forward. Yeah, I think it would be a great idea to do something maybe that's something can swap and look at mm -hmm. like i said i i was actually kind of pleasantly surprised that it was there but also disappointed that i wasn't even it's been going on since 2009 and i wasn't even that aware that it that it was something that was recognized and um with with the billions of dollars that um, equivalent, I guess, that people spend looking after somebody else of, of, in any capacity, it would be nice to have something a little more, um, I'd like to know more about it, I'd like to know. Great. Um... One question I have is, um, as um, in your day-to-day -day jobs, both Trisha and Barb, <clears throat> what are some of the challenges that you see caregivers to um, patients with kidney disease experience? Um, and I'm, I'm only asking just to maybe help validate for anyone who's watching that they're not alone, that there are, you know, often some areas of friction um, when you're dealing with um, someone you're caregiving or someone with kidney disease and, and in your experiences, sort of what does that look like? I think one of the things that I find with kidney disease that's a little bit different um, than something like a cancer diagnosis 
is when we're looking at a cancer diagnosis, we know that we're going to step up to support our loved one and we're going to give them everything we have for six months, eight months. Um, but when we're looking at something like kidney disease, this for some of our patients can be lifelong. And so oftentimes um, I think family wants to give it everything they can, but as we talked about, a lot of those caregiver burden um, pieces start to present themselves, right? That burnout becomes prevalent. Um, and so as our caregivers burn out and we, you know, swap out for maybe a sister or a brother or an aunt or an uncle or whatever that may be, if we're not able to make sure that they're taking the best care of themselves while they're caring for our patient, we can see those cycles continue and continue um, just because it is a long haul. It's not, not a short-term thing. Mm -hmm. Barb, is there anything else that, that comes uh, to you? I, I would find, I, I would echo what um, Tricia is saying. And I, I think for some of our folks, if, if there's any resources that I can think of to provide to people, even if it's practical things, when I started here in dialysis, I started here in dialysis in 2020. And um, one of the things that we weren't doing consistently at that time was, for example, the disability tax credit. So it's just a very, it could amount to a very small amount of money for people that they can, you know, pay it slightly less taxes. But if there's any kind of small amount over a period of time, that adds up. And so we can't necessarily, I look at it from the perspective, I can't necessarily change the fact that somebody has kidney disease and this is an ongoing chronic illness that has to be managed day to day. But if there's some little tiny benefit that can be applied that they could use, then I try and make sure that people are aware and, and if appropriate, not everybody is appropriate for receiving it, that, that they can get that benefit. Um, but I, I think you know, if we can set things up so that there's certain things that are on a regular basis, even if it just means getting to dialysis consistently, so the caregiver has that time at home as opposed to bringing them back and forth to dialysis, again, that's a little bit of time that they can recoup. And again, it's not always sometimes even coming, the patient might need somebody to be with them. But if there's any way that we can make it just easier for people, we, we, we try and have those conversations. Yeah, and not feeling guilty in doing that, in, yeah. in saying, you know, it is okay that I'm not the one bringing my loved one every single time. It's, you know, it's all right to pool those supports in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any other questions from the attendees, but one thing I wanted, um, thought maybe be a good opportunity right now is to talk a little bit about the Canadian Association of Nephrology so Social Workers and sort of what is nephrology social work and, and, and what makes that different from other kinds of social work? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, so nephrology social work is kidney social work. Um, nephrology is just a really big word for kidney. Um, so your kidney doctors are referred to as nephrologists um, and us social workers who are working within nephrology or within kidney care are referred to as nephrology social workers or medical social workers. So we have a fairly robust group from across Canada. Um, we are all part of an association that is above and beyond our regular um, licensing board or licensing association. Um, so we come together to support one another um, to look at consistency of programming across Canada, uh, to learn what's working well in Ontario versus Saskatchewan, or um, if we've got questions about something that is a national program like the disability tax credit, um, how can we best support our patients in that? Um, making sure that we're aware of any changes within those programs that again, impact us all right across Canada. Um, BC has some phenomenal resources. So again, just having that opportunity to, to learn and support and make sure that we're getting those resources into the hands of our patients um, and support for one another, right? Just like um, as caregivers, um, our patients and our families need support, but we do as well as social workers. So 
that helps to kind of create that environment for us there. Uh, I don't know, Barbara, what else would you add in there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, like it is, it, it, it is unique in terms of, um, like I spent quite a few years working as an inpatient social worker, but across different areas. So it might've been acute medicine or rehab or, um, you know, complex care. And the focus there was just a little bit different um, as a hospital social worker and being in the nephrology, it's, I think, I think one thing that I have found, I don't know if this really answers your question, but because people are coming on a regular basis, you really get to know them and over time develop more of a, a, a trust kind of relationship and um, be able to see people through their journey uh, and, and just be able to, you know, build trust and develop a relationship. And I find that as time goes on, more, you know, patients will say, well, I, I want to talk to you about this thing or this thing that I'm struggling with. And it isn't always specifically about, you know, kidneys or kidney disease. It could be I'm having some housing issues and I, I, I need some help with that, or I'm having some family issues or some conflict and I need help with that. Or, um, you know, I, I, I want to do some traveling and we just have that conversation with people and be able to um, build relationships, which we don't always get to do in other areas. Yeah. yeah. And I think Cancer has really got a focus on advocacy as well. And so yes. taking the, you know, collaborative voices of all of us from across Canada and what we're seeing with our patients um, and helping organizations such as the PKD Foundation or the Kidney Foundation of Canada in regards to those advocacy efforts. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> we've got five more minutes. I still, I am not seeing any other questions. Um, so unless someone wants to ask a question quickly, um, I do want to say, you know, thank you so much, uh, Barb and Tricia, um, for being here today and sharing your presentation on care, caregiver burnout and how to, um, try and prevent it or avoid it or how to deal with it. Uh, I know this particular topic will be um, really valuable for our community and it has been recorded today. So this is something that will live on on our YouTube channel and be able to help um, more care caregivers in the future. So thank both of you uh, for being here. I'd also just like to add for any of the people watching, um, if you have additional questions that you wanna ask, want us to ask, healthcare professionals like Barb and Trisha, um, feel free to email us at the PKD Foundation of Canada anytime. Our email address is there in the chat right now. It's npkd at npkd.ca. Uh, and you can also find more information um, and we will have the, the resource that um, has been shared in this presentation by Barb and Trisha. Um, we'll be sending that out to an email to all the registrants today. So. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.